Good morning, church. I was just about to go and do some more visiting. Darn it. I guess I got to wait now. Welcome to 11 o'clock worship at Christ United Methodist Church. Welcome if you're here live or if you're watching us on cable or streaming us. Hey, a couple of quick announcements I want to share with you. We've been talking about couple checkup for weeks. You have seven more days. These sheets are available at the front entrance, the back entrance at the information desk. And there's a, a, a voucher code in here, C-U-M-C, couple checkup. It's a free checkup for anybody who's dating, engaged, or married. Our goal is not to talk about compatibility. That's not what this is. This is an instrument that will help you to see where there are areas in your relationship that you may want to work on to grow your relationship to make it even better. So we have currently 44 couples who have taken this. I do not have access to your results, so relax. Nobody's going to be saying, hmm, looked at your results and looks like you need to come in for counseling. That's not going to happen. All I see is, is an aggregate report of everybody that did it. And I can see that of the 44 couples in this church that have taken it, this is their greatest growth need, which is conflict resolution. Their second greatest is communication, okay? And we're going to do some things with that. If you were to do this and you get your report and you say, oh my gosh, we have a growth area here, if you jump onto Right Now Media, and if you need information about that, text or email me and I'll get you connected. Right now, media under the Christ UMC Franklin Library, there are channels that have video suggestions for each of the areas in couple checkup, all right? So we've already selected those. They're already there for you to watch. We'll be talking more about right now media in the weeks ahead, so stay tuned for that. Because you count sheet, please fill it out so we know who's all's here. We can, we can keep track and we can be faithful with our attendance numbers to the annual conference. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. That means Lent is starting. Holy cow. We're doing a combined service at Grace United Methodist Church in Rocky Grove. Yours truly is bringing the message. I hope you'll consider coming and being a part of that Ash Wednesday service. This Friday is Fridays are free. There's a place on Because You Count to sign up that says, hey, I'd like to help out with Fridays are free. Last month, they served over 170 individuals at Fridays are Free. Good stuff. So they definitely need help. Um, next Sunday is going to be a busy Sunday here. After the 8.15 and the 9.35, there will be folks in Heritage Hall to talk about kids going to camp. They'll be in all three worship services doing a little blurb. We're going to have people from Wesley Woods, Seneca Hills, and now I hear we may have somebody from Cherry Run here to talk to kids about getting into camp. If you've never sent your kids to camp, here's what you need to know. Christ United Methodist Church will help foot the cost. We will help get your kids to camp so money should not be an issue, all right? After the 11 o'clock service, we're going to celebrate Jonathan Smith and his wife, Sarah. Jonathan has resigned from his position here as youth director, and we want to celebrate what he has done for the last six plus years. So that's going to be at 11 o'clock in Heritage Hall. I hope you'll be there to help celebrate them. Last piece, the last Saturday in March, 28th, I believe it is, Art of Marriage right here in this sanctuary. It's a video-based all-day-long seminar. There it is on the screen. If you go to our homepage, our website homepage at the bottom is registration for the art of marriage. You click that button, you give us some basic information, it's gonna tell you the cost is $25. That's for you and your partner. It's your written material, your lunch, and some snacks in the morning. And it's even gonna put it on your calendar. If you use a digital calendar, that link will do all of that for you. So I hope you'll consider coming and participating in that at the end of March. Alrighty. Let's pause for a word of prayer, and we're going to take off and do some worship. Let's pray. Father God, we find ourselves here for a variety of reasons. Some of us couldn't wait to get here, and others of us were looking for reasons to not show up, but we wound up here anyway. And some of us, Father, are somewhere in the middle. I pray, Lord, that you would Surprise us today. Reveal yourself to us in ways that we 
hadn't even imagined when we left home. May we sense your presence, may we hear your voice, may we know your loving touch today as we worship in this holy place. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, amen. Welcome to worship. Why don't you stand up this morning and say hi to somebody around you as the praise team comes up and takes their position. Let's sing together, church. Bless the Lord.
Oh God, we come today to worship your holy name. You are a great God. You are worthy to be praised. So we lift our praise to you with our song, with our hearts. Thank you for loving us and bringing us to this place. Receive our praise, oh God. You're great. Your name is that above all names. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, sing it. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in love.
pray. God, thank you for inviting us to your house. Thank you for giving us a place at your table. Thank you, Lord, for telling us we are loved. Give us a confidence to never forget that. Lord, that and so much more we have to be thankful for. And now, Lord, as we continue our worship, We worship with our gifts to you. We will worship by giving thanks to you. Receive our gifts, O God, as our expression of gratitude. And use them to build your church so that others may know that they too are welcome into your family through Jesus Christ. So bless these gifts, these giver, we pray in the name of Jesus. And Lord, bless Caleb as he ministers to us. Amen. You may be seated. away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. King of endless world, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song. A song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. It's all. 
all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what Good morning again, church. Good to be among you. If you will take out your Bibles and turn to 1 John 1, 1 to 5, if you want to grab the Pew Bible in front of you, that's on page 1737. 1 John 1, 1 to 5, if you want to use your electronic Bible, feel free. This is what God's Word says to us today. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is a message we have heard from Him and declare to you, God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. This is the end of the reading of God's Word. Well, welcome to our last message on stewardship. Next Sunday starts Lent, and we are going to be journeying um, starting next Sunday for the next six weeks toward Easter, and we're going to be doing it um, with the aid, and I didn't tell the people at 815 and 935, so it'll be a surprise to them. We're going to be doing it with the cross that we always have here for Lent, and we're going to be hanging symbols on that cross every week. And each week, we're going to journey through those symbols as we prepare to celebrate Easter. So I hope you'll um, be ready for that. Next week, we talk about the cross specifically. So as we wrap up this time on stewardship, we've been defining a steward as one who has been entrusted with a resource. In our case, we, we are the ones entrusted. God has entrusted you and I with a resource, and he expects us to use it wisely for his kingdom. As a United Methodist, um, we ask a question of all people who come into membership, and in this church, the question goes this way. As a member of Christ United Methodist Church, will you support our ministry by your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? And so we've been journeying through these five words. The first week we talked about service, how God has entrusted us with an ability to connect with other people. Excuse me, and he, he desires for us to serve. The second week, we talked about our prayers and presence and how God has given us the ability to connect with him through prayer and and come into his space of worship and how he expects us to steward that with others. Last week, we talked about gifts, 
about how he has entrusted us with material possessions and he expects us to share it. And this week we want to wrap up with talking about our witness. Now, when we talk about witness, we most often go here, amen? Um, someone in a court of law swearing that they'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God, and they witness to what they have seen, heard, know. Well, in the text that we read, there are two words, testify and proclaim. The word proclaim in Greek means to make known openly, to declare or proclaim. The word testify in Greek is martyrio, and it's a word that we get the word martyr from, someone who has been killed for their faith, who has witnessed um, for, for Jesus, and it has cost them their life. This is the word we get it from. So we are called to be witnesses, to bear witness, even, dare I say, to the point of losing our own life. Well, when we're talking about witness, I really want to talk about it on two levels. The first level is our everyday speech, whether we're at school or at work or at home or in a grocery store, how our everyday speech ought to testify, ought to witness to our worldview. You know, some people talk about what's happening in their life and they talk about chance and luck and destiny and fortune and their own accomplishments. And everything in life is in those terms, but that's not who we are. We are followers of the Most High God. We are, we are ones who have come into a relationship with our Creator God. And for us, we recognize what James 1.17 says. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. If we are followers of the King and we believe Scripture, then it means that everything good happening in your life Every bit of light happening in your life has one source. It's not you, it's not chance, it's not fortune, it's God. And we ought to be speaking that way in our day-to-day -day lives. Pastor David Jans used to serve here, would often say uh, in my presence when we'd be in covenant group, he'd tell us about something great that was happening in, family, in his family, and he would just pause and say, thank you, Lord, in the way only David can say that. And it was his way of saying, no matter how good this is, or no matter how challenging, this is all about my walk with God. He's giving testimony. He's witnessing to what God is doing in his life. At a deeper level, witness can also be about telling our story. Some people call that a testimony. And you have all heard people give testimonies. Sometimes they're kind of interesting. I have a colleague who, um, if you look at him, you notice something very quickly is different about him. He has one completely normal, it's this one, one completely normal ear and one ear that it, it looks like something like took the whole top of the ear and like, like bit it right out. And if you say, hey, hey, Bruce, what happened to your ear? He will give you a testimony. He'll give you a witness. He'll He'll confess to what happened. But his first question is, well, do you want to hear the long version or the short version? The short version takes 58 minutes. The long version takes just about an hour. Which one do you want to hear? And when you listen to his story, I'm fond of saying, you will laugh, you will cry, and you will recommit your life to Jesus. What he literally did was hunting one day. He is shifting. He's got his gun in his side, and he's, he's, he's a rather large guy, and he's kind of trying to hold the gun by his arm and, and change his gloves, and all of a sudden he hears a deafening noise, and the gun had gone off, and the bullet shot the top of his ear right off. He was sure he was going to die. In fact, had things not lined up the way they did, he probably would have died. They finally got him to the hospital and got the ear pretty much taken care of. And they said, look, you know, you're still in all your hunting gear. Let's take this off and make sure nothing else is going off on. And as they start peeling back the layers, first his wool rich coat, and that, they begin to see blood. And they look, and there is a scratch that starts here and goes the whole way up his chest before the bullet leaves his jacket and takes off his ear. The fact that he's still alive 
is miraculous. But when he tells that story, I mean, you sit motionless for an hour. I've heard him tell it three times, and every time it's a wonderful story. That's how Bruce tells stories. He is a preacher. He can talk a long time. So here's my story. Now, some people have faith experiences that happen at a moment in time. You know what I'm talking about. Billy Graham was big on this. He was probably the most famous Baptist pastor. And, and Billy Graham would say, tell me the date, time, and place that you got saved, right? He wanted to know, when did you come to that crisis in your life where you said, oh, my gosh, I'm a sinner and I need God and I commit my life to Jesus? Boom, you write that down. John Wesley was not unlike that. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, it's recorded after having been ordained an Anglican priest, raised in a Christian home. His father was a pastor, but quite honestly, his mother was much better than his dad at being a pastor. Dad had a small congregation. Dad left for a few weeks, and mom started holding Bible study in her kitchen. She had 200 people showing up for Bible study in her kitchen. Like, she was amazing. So he's, he's raised in a home of faith. He becomes an Anglican priest. He goes to the Americas, to the Georgia colony, in his words, to save the savages. He has this harrowing experience aboard ship between here and, and England. He gets back to England, and one night he's at a Bible study with a bunch of Moravians. It's May 24th, 1738. It's a Wednesday. Somebody is reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. And John Wesley describes it this way. About a quarter before nine, while one was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Then I testified openly what I now first felt in my heart. John Wesley could tell you date, time, and place that his heart was strangely warmed. Three days before, his brother had had a similar experience. Billy Graham would have been very proud of John Wesley for being able to do that. The funny thing is, Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Bell Graham, could not tell you date, time, and place. He was a famous Baptist pastor. She was raised the son of a Presbyterian missionary, born in China. She met Billy Graham at Wheaton College, and they got married. She died a Presbyterian. He was a Baptist. She said, I cannot tell you date, time, and place. She said, I was grown up in the church. She talks in her testimony about, about encountering God throughout life. And her story is not that different from my own. You see, I was raised in a home led by a mom and a dad who in the early 1950s attended a Youth for Christ event. Some of us are conjecturing it was probably at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall in Pittsburgh because that's where those things were held. I need to confirm that with Dad. Don't know if he'll still remember he is 89, but anyway. They both turned their life over to Christ at that event. Now, interesting piece. Do you know who the CEO was and the starter of Youth for Christ? Billy Graham. They were first-generation Youth for Christ people. I was raised in a home where there was literally never, ever any alcohol, period. There was never any cussing or swearing. It was not tolerated. Where we went to church every Sunday, four doors up at Nixon United Methodist Church. If the doors were open, I was there. Sunday school, worship, youth group, chicken barbecue. I'd spray the chicken as they turn them. I wasn't big enough to turn the, the, the uh, big mesh things that had the chicken in them. But I was there all the time. But it was at that church, between third and fourth grade, that Mrs. Shakely convinced me that God was not out there somewhere. He was right here. 
And it was at that church and through that church's ministry that I would go to Christian concerts and youth events and district rallies with youth and and worship services. And I would answer altar call after altar call after altar call because every time I felt like, you know what, I, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I don't have to look far to find evidence for that. And Lord, I want to make sure that I am committed to you. I can't tell you the first time I answered an altar call. I can't even tell you the date of the last one I answered. But I can tell you that one day, I sat in the pews as an altar call was announced. And I felt absolutely no compunction to move. It wasn't that I felt that I had stopped sinning. I didn't have to look far for that evidence. It wasn't that I felt like I didn't have anything to grow in. I knew there was plenty of places I need to grow. But I knew in that moment that God had already claimed me. That I was already his. That answering another altar call was not what I needed to do. What I needed to do was continue on my journey of allowing God to work in my life. Since that day... Life has had challenges, serious challenges. Since that day and his forgiveness, I have experienced challenges like the death of my mother at the age of 24 while I was in seminary. I have experienced challenges like sexual assault, divorce, dealing with rumor and gossip in a church that did its level best to bury me. But in every one of those situations, there was never a question where God was. It was never that I felt that God was busy helping, dealing with somebody else's problems. I knew that the only reason I was standing was because he stood me up. He dusted me off. He was giving me what I needed to move on. To be honest with you, that's the only way I moved forward was with his presence. Some days that presence was hard to feel. I remember one worship service after the divorce that I was attempting to lead worship. The boys were at their moms. And we had a time in that worship service like we do here where we greet one another. And I knew there was only one thing to do. I announced to go say hi to somebody, and I turned and I made a beeline for my organist, and I said, Ruth, either you start praying right now and don't stop till this worship service is over, or I'm not getting through this because I don't have what it takes today. You see, the Lord carried me in those times and made sure I had what I needed to continue to move forward. So it begs the question, what's your story? How did you come to faith? How has God been revealing himself to you? Where do you feel God's presence most prevalently? Is it at a retreat center? Is it in this sanctuary? Is it in a Sunday school room or your home or out in nature or in a kayak? Where is God growing your faith? Where is he revealing himself to you? He has called you and I. He has forgiven you and I. That's the resource he's put within us. And he asks us to be good stewards of that story, that experience, and share it so others may hear it and come to faith. Now, if you're going to share your story, let me just make a couple of quick suggestions. When you're sharing your story, first of all, be short. We call it an elevator speech. You know how that goes. You get on an elevator with somebody and the doors close and they say, what do you do for a living? Or, or how are you? Or who are you? And you have until the doors open up again to share with them that information. That is not the time that you say, I was born September 16th, 1963. The son of an independent grocery store owner, the fourth of seven children. Doors open, they're gone. End of story. No, that speech has got to be short. I'd encourage you to jot it down so you know the key points. And it needs to be focused not on us, but on what God has done in us, through us, continues to do in us. Some people like this idea. You talk about life before Christ, 
For some of you, that's a pretty dramatic story. The shift from BC days, as we say, to Christian days is radical. But don't get lost there. Share with people how you encountered Christ. Where was it? When was it that God opened your eyes that you saw him and your need for him for the very first time? And then talk about life since that encounter. Don't only talk about the good stuff. This is not a moment to just brag on Facebook. Remember, if we try to convince people that our life has been perfect since we came to Christ, they know we're inauthentic and they're not going to listen to us. I find it, quite honestly, more effective to tell them how God got you through the fire and through the storm and through the chaos. That means way more to many people than how he gave you grace and helped you to celebrate. What would it look like if you began to tell your story? To confess your faith on a daily basis, saying to those around you, I cannot believe what God has been doing. Or as simple as, thank you, Lord. I got through that exam. Thank you, Lord, that my feet hit the floor this morning. Thank you, Lord, that I am loved by my spouse. Thank you, Lord, that I have children in my life and they bring me joy even when they're chaotic. Thank you, Lord, that I have a church that I appreciate. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me the grace to earn money and provide for my family. Thank you, Lord, that I get the blessing of traveling and sightseeing. Thank you, Lord, that my car still runs. And I got through the blinding snow and didn't put it in the ditch. Thank you, Lord. And occasionally when the opportunity presents itself, be sure to be a good steward of the story he's placed within you. Man, my life was a mess. And God stepped in and it's not been the same since. There have been plenty of pitfalls and places I've been disobedient and times I've dropped the ball, and he never, ever leaves me. He never, ever forsakes me. He does not change, even though some days I'm hot for God and some days I'm cold, and some days I'm just lukewarm. But God is always ready to hear me. What's he doing in your life? My prayer is that the people around you this week will not have to wonder whether you're a Christ follower, but they will know that as far as you're concerned, every good and perfect gift has only one source, and that's your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, it is so easy to focus on the negative and the things that we wish were the way that they're not. It's so easy, Father, to complain and to find fault, to feel like a victim. It's so easy, Father, to listen to the voice of darkness and fall into that hole. But, Father, you are light. Around you there is no darkness at all, and you bring every good and perfect gift and place it in our lap. May we never tire of telling the story of who you are and what you've done in our lives. May others wander and be anxious to get to know you because of what they hear from us and see in us. We ask us in the name of the Christ. Amen. Let us stand. As we sing this song, please feel free to use the prayer cards that are in the back of the pews. If you have a prayer need, let us know. We can be praying for those, and we can have others be praying this week. If you have a praise, write that down also. Come. 
Feel free to pause for a word of prayer at the altar railing. Let us offer ourselves now to the Lord with these words together. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Sing that again. Here's my Father, we need your truth. The world would love for us to believe lies. But Lord, we know that you alone possess truth. Father, speak it into us. May we know truth from lie. May we be strengthened by your truth. May we be healed by your truth. May we have hope and courage and peace because of your truth. Father, I hold in my hand the heart cry of so many people. But there are so many more heart cries held within the hearts of those within the sound of my voice. Speak truth there as well, Father. That we may trust you and know you and see light from you. We ask all this, Father, in your amazing gracious and strong name of Jesus. 
For it's in his name that we have strength and power. Amen and amen. Go in peace and may the peace of Christ go with you.